So Lek is going to talk about all the wonderful flowers you might see on San Bruno Mountain. Um, I've been up there with Lek many times. Um, looks like he's got a couple of pictures of me there on that and with Doug and Mark. Uh, and you'll never see anybody bounding around these steep hillsides uh, the way Lek does. He makes an old man like me uh, feel even older. So Lek, go for it. Thank you very much, David. And um, I wanted to do something a little different here um, and soften up things a little bit. And uh, whoops, going the wrong way. Add some uh, add some flora. And then I also wanted to open up the mic to anyone. There is so much botanical expertise on this group, and botany by committee um, always takes the longest. And you don't necessarily get to the right answer, but you have the most fun getting there. So if anyone has any comments on any of these um, texts I go through, please feel free to do that. My goal is to kind of just show off a few of the pictures I've taken over the years um, and uh, just talk about some of the special qualities of it. Um, so I titled this presentation, The Franciscan Island Flora, um, San Bruno Mountains and Beyond. And this whole concept of, uh, Oh, let me talk about these. Uh, let me talk about these little pictures on the front. So these were uh, images from being out there with David and Doug and many other folks. Um, it was an absolute blast um, going out there and doing this work. Um, whenever I engage in scientific work, I try and include. Um, you know, it's hard to call you the public, but um, anyone who's willing to come along because it just adds so much to um, the process. There was so much learning and it was just such a great time. So I included three photos from a couple of our hikes out there. Um, James Roof, uh, which I just recently learned, was actually a uh, Daly City resident. He was the director of the Tilden Botanical Garden. Um, a really interesting figure historically and one that um, I think there uh, are, will continue to be a lot of conversations about. He did some things that um, may never be accepted and um, some things that were very progressive and started a um, whole new movement. So um, one of his contributions though is naming. Um, and when he talked about the San Bruno Mountains as well as some of the um, coastal uh, uh, high points. He called that uh, area native Franciscan vegetation. So it's along these higher peaks. Um, so including San Francisco that you're looking at with an old 1938 map overlaying on that up through Marin and all the way down through San Bruno Mountain. So that was uh, considered, he considered those islands um, very similar to Sky Islands. They get similar precipitation, but he actually, um, if I'm not mistaken, believed that uh, the, they were actually physically islands when uh, water levels were higher at one point. Um, but the vegetation certainly is unique, and I want to focus in on this Franciscan vegetation. It is not regularly recognized, so if you talked about native Franciscan vegetation to most vegetation ecologists, they wouldn't know what you're talking about unless they know about him roof and some of the lore around him. Um, so some of this work comes from a rare plant survey and I have to ask Hannah if it's publicly available or not. There are some locations, there's some CNDDB data in there. So I'm not sure if it's a public report or not, but I had the distinct pleasure of tromping around the mountain um, with Crystal Niederer, um, also Stu was on some of these, uh, and looking for some of these rare plants and updating uh, the rare plant database. Um, so one of the first ones that comes out as a really unique Franciscan is this um, mustard, and what I think is one of the uh, most beautiful mustards out there. It's uh, Erebus, um, and uh, I think most commonly people call it Coast Rock Crest. Um, it grows in these little patches. Um, it's perfect for little rock gardens. Um, and it produces a copious amount of seed, as many mustards do. Um, but it's a perennial, so it actually sticks around for a few years. And it's just a real 
um, beautiful taste of, of color. And for those who are familiar with wild radish that was mentioned in the last couple talks ago, um, it's somewhat similar looking in terms of the um, petal color. Um, another one here, I pulled in a little bit closer on this. Um, one might say, actually, Leck, you missed the focus on that one, and I would say that's fine. I, I'm good with that. Um, this is Basilia malviflora, and what I actually want people to tune into here is this absolutely fantastic, see these little black dots? Anytime they ask if a plant is glandular or not, that's what you're looking for. And these are just so absolutely fantastic. The common name for this one is stinging phacelia, which means if you pick it up, you will remember that you picked it up. Um, this is a, a taxon that uh, pretty much is what I call a non-matrix taxon. So you'll see it in little places here and there, um, but uh, it's uh, limited to the central coast for the most part. Um, this is one of our sweethearts that we were looking for, San Francisco Kalinzia. And this is a tiny little um, annual. It is uh, sometimes also called Chinese houses when you look at the more common one, Heterophila. It's uh, also a Kalinzia. Um, but these Kalinzias are one way that they pull apart from a lot of the more common ones is they're actually a lot less showy um, and they tend to have fewer flowers per inflorescence um, and the remarkable thing about this one is and I don't think I dug it up the largest population of this plant which is listed is actually in an old quarry site not the active quarry but the um, uh, I think we've called it the uh, uh, what's David I'm forgetting the place name for the other quarry Boneyard. Boneyard Quarry. Yeah, yes, boneyard. it's the Boneyard Quarry because okay. of the owl that you found up there and the pellets that it puts out and the rain dissolves it into bones. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. The Boneyard. I, I, I was sure I was slipping into my domino days, but okay. So that's this is the Boneyard great, Quarry. That's um, also a great San Bruno elfin population there. Yes, so this is a remarkable area. So this was originally um, probably a test pit and it is this, um, now it is just basically what looks like a scree field. And there aren't that many natural scree fields on San Bruno Mountain. It's a fairly weathered mountain as we know, but um, this Kalinzia grows in large patches there. Um, and as we were doing this survey, this is really exciting. Uh, it, we were clambering around the rocks, me being who I am. And there I am, one hand on top, second hand on top. It's about three, three feet to get up and peek over. And there I see, boom, 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 three little chicken eggs. But in fact, they weren't chickens. They were great horned owls. And it was a little great horned owl nest. I was very grateful that mama was not around. Um, but it was, this boneyard quarry is just an absolute gem. Um, I don't think you're going to find it on any trail uh, map, but it is a very unique botanical area. Um, I want to take a second to talk about Arisimum franciscanum. So this is a really interesting taxon. This is one that's actually limited um, also to the central coast area. And there's a little bit of interesting ambiguity around this one because its genetics are um, fairly complicated. So within Franciscanum, just like Silene viricunda, which we talked about, it's become kind of a dumping ground where no one's um, really done the genetics recently with the, uh, um, at least unless somebody can correct me, nobody's done the genetics um, to really differentiate these taxa well. And so you have these oranges sometimes lumped in with the yellowies and uh, you can see the petal morphology and shape is quite different. Um, but these are kind of some of the, the, this is one of the fantastic listed species that's also doing really well on the mountain. And this is also in the Brassicaceae family. So this is that mustard family again, where you see those four petals. Ah, uh, no presentation would be 
complete without uh, the star of the mountain. Um, so this is, of course, Silene Vericunda. Um, and this comes in so many shapes and so many different forms. Um, David talked to you uh, about a number of chapters. Um, there's also one more chapter, David, I might add to it, um, which is uh, as we were um, searching populations for populations of this plant, we know that um, Mount Davidson is the type locale, um, but there are also um, there are also quite a bit of efforts to um, get this plant reestablished in the Presidio. Um, and there is also occurrences historic of Silene Vericunda there. The interesting th thing there is that this plant um, there in the Presidio actually, um, actually flowers at a different time of year, fruits at a different time of year, and has tremendously different morphology where it is very, very much more branched. The Silene Vericunda we find on the mountain, for instance, has four or five stems at most or inflorescent stalks, if you will. You go to the Presidio and you find some of these sites where they've restored them in, in sandy soil, not, not um, uh, bedrock um, and pure, uh, poorly um, weathered soils, but actual sandy soils. And they'll have 20 stems. They'll have 20 inflorescent stalks. Remarkably different and really unique. So this is another one where um, uh, uh, there's, there's still uh, yet to be determined on this guy. Let's see if I can... Uh oh, there we go. Okay, um, <laughs> this is Crystal Neater out there in a sea of um, Arctostaphylus imbricata. Um, this is a social trail, probably, and probably an animal trail here. Um, this was one of the most remarkable natural history um, uh, experiences I've had in a while. Uh, Crystal and I were eating lunch, and we saw what were probably 200 um, ravens crows, depending on who you talk to in the Bay Area, in one single spot here on this hillside and um, just congregating. Never seen such large um, congregation of birds here. Um, only later, uh, David Nelson, I think you were the one who told me that they were probably munching on some yummy um, larvae um, that also uh, infest this plant and actually impact it. Um, the Imbricata is a really interesting plant, also named San Bruno Manzanita, um, notably, and I know uh, the Parker Vasey um, uh, 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 set of professors will talk about this endlessly, but it really is interesting how this starts to look very similar to Montera Mountain uh, Manzanita and becomes a Monterensis as it grows a little taller and almost and it almost seems to bleed into it in the mountain. It really feels like there's um, a place where maybe some hybridization is happening. Um, California huckleberries. Um, this is just a tremendous plant. Uh, it is only located on a couple of spots near the summit that I've seen it, but I think there are a few more locations, this is Ericaceae, so it has the beautiful bell-shaped flowers, very reminiscent of manzanitas and other taxa, um, and actually makes uh, quite tasty berries. Um, and this one is really interesting because it's very coastally restricted. Um, and on the case of San Bruno Mountain, it's interesting to see it at such a high elevation where it's really benefiting from the fog. Um, here's another interesting relic. So this is actually Rosaceae family, um, Amelanchier, Utahensis. Uh, as the name says, it's fairly well distributed in the United States, uh, the Western United States, I should say. Um, but this taxon in particular um, is quite interesting in our neck of the woods. And if I'm correct, McClintock actually um, 
uh, I believe, initially called this um, Amelanchier pallida. Um, and so there's a little bit, here's another PhD thesis for those budding um, students who are looking for something to work on. Amelanchier seems to be a little bit of a dumping ground. There seems to be a whole lot of um, conversations about genetics and what people are seeing um, in different sites. So at minimum, a lot of different races of this plant. Um, this one forms a tremendous uh, stand that is on a, I guess I would call it an east facing slope. Um, and it's absolutely a gorgeous shrub. This was a favorite find on a hike with David and Doug and um, some other folks. Um, this is an oak, but it's a scrubby oak. Uh, and it seems to have a whole lot of characteristics of Quercus cologiae, um, which is the black oak. But it's very typical of that Franciscan form that Jim Roof talked about. This rarely, um, I don't believe this stand gets much taller than uh, over the top of our heads or maybe three meters. Um, it certainly doesn't look like a large black oak that you would see in Yosemite. Um, and so there may be some hybridization going on here, um, but uh, there is a really remarkable um, path of this. Um, uh, coming down, what ridge is that, David? Do you recall? There's some of this Oracle Oak uh, right next to Roof Rock, which is just next to the upper parking lot. And there's some more further out, the Ridge Trail. That's it, the Ridge Trail. Thank you. That's what I was thinking of. Um, so again, a really, really interesting form and one that, again, portrays that Franciscan kind of signature. Um, you know, everybody's seen this guy. Uh, they, they know it. Uh, this is good old footsteps to spring, Sinicula arctopoides. Um, the interesting thing about this is when you look at the distribution of this plant um, in California, um, and I think, it's, I think it's an endemic, California endemic, um, rarely will you find this plant more than um, five miles or so away from the coast. Um, San Bruno Mountain again has that fog influence and that maritime influence and it seems to do pretty well. Um, and it also probably serves as a really important uh, nectar source for a lot of the early season butterflies that come out. Um, this is a favorite that is often overlooked, um, but it has, when you really jump into it, you will see that it has hairy petals. And you can see a little bit of these hairs remaining, but there aren't that many plants that have truly hairy petals throughout. So this is woolly fruited desert parsley or Lomatium daisy carpum, um, subspecific daisy carpum. Uh, also a really, really important butterfly plant. Um, just speaking from an architectural standpoint, um, in terms of plants, this one tends to, much like yarrow, it has a nice, large landing platform. And so this is really important for the bigger and the heavier butterflies. Um, and they can land on this safely and, and be able to nectar um, and um, continue along on their life cycle. Sedelcium alveflora. Uh, this is one that is also serves as a really, really important nectar plant. Um, it is very showy. Uh, the checker mallow, um, certainly you can see it uh, uh, on San Bruno, you'll see it up on Twin Peaks, and this is one that has that Franciscan uh, signature to it as well. Um, and this one I threw in there, and I know it's not um, fully evolved, but do, folks might recognize this. Um, I love this because of uh, the slight awkwardness of this photo. Um, <laughs> plants let you photograph them even when they're feeling awkward. And um, people don't typically let you do that. But here you can see the petals finishing up in the petal color. So this is very uh, obviously an inferior ovary. So here are the petals that are dying down from um, the viola. And then this is the ovary that is expanding. And then interesting 
Interestingly enough, we have a problem with regeneration of this um, taxon, which is Viola pedunculata. Look at this, somebody's in here munching. They got in here right the right time before this becomes a really solid, hard seed coat and then pops open and breathes. Um, and they might be munching on those seeds, um, uh, therefore reducing um, uh, fecundity of this plant. Staying on the viola, this is a, a just, I think one of the most adorable violas out there. Um, this is, uh, I believe Viola adunca, which is the dog violet, and it's just beautifully nestled in these rocks. And this is about, it's about this size. <laughs> it doesn't get much bigger. And it just quietly um, does really well in these little crevices and small rocky places and adds yet that beautiful splash of purple um, to some of these scenes. So uh, I really enjoy finding this little one. It's always a gem. It's never in very large populations um, anywhere I've seen on the mountain. Um, next, you know, this is, this is one of those beautiful nature adaptations. So this is um, our native iris. Um, Longipedula, which is a also one of our special status taxa. Um, you got to love the yellow stripe and the highway for the pollinators. Um, they're tuning into that color, going walking down into that floral tube, um, grabbing their nectar, pollinating at the same time, and then getting out of there. And it's just, it really is just a gorgeous, almost feels like a watercolor type plant. This plant is doing extremely well um, and typically we find it associated with seeps and slightly wetter soils. Um, this is a really neat one. This is one I learned on San Bruno and I hadn't seen before. This is actually beech knotweed um, and it's in the Polygonaceae family and so it has these sheathing stems, um, very sandy soil. And for those who have spent time on San Bruno Mountain, of course we know about the dunes, this is also located um, not far off the parkway there where there's a little pull off. And I think it is actually the same pull off for, for um, Boneyard, for the Boneyard. And he, this plant is just, was such a remarkable, beautiful um, set of white flowers, green stems in the heat of the summer. Um, and it caught my eye and I had no idea what it was. Um, well out of, range here. So I actually um, put in the floor of North America um, uh, text here for it, which is which actually aligns with the E flora for the Jepson flora. And they say it's elevational range, which I've highlighted zero to 50 meters. So for any of you young collectors and botanists out there, if you would like to collect a sample of this with permission, um, you will find that it's at least at 100, if not 150 meters high making it the single highest population of this plant ever recorded. So um, talk to me if you want to do that homework. Um, this is one I love. Uh, I love so much I named my daughter after this um, genus. Uh, and Castilea is just a gorgeous hemiparasitic uh, hemi plant. Um, in this case, this is White's paintbrush, which is a remarkably interesting species, also very coastally restricted. Again, San Bruno Mountain. Um, there's a little bit over in the East Bay, a few occurrences in the East Bay Hills. Um, but this plant is known to be parasitic on numerous hosts at the same time, according to research. And it really does well in these kind of Franciscan scrub communities. Um, very showy. Um, this is something that I'm hoping we'll see bay checker spot butterflies on because they also do and can utilize Castilea um, during seasons when um, other host plants are limited. I know there's a lot of Plantago lanceolata out there, but um, this might be a potential native host that they would transfer over to. And then these guys, um, you know, I love 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 the agosaurus um, genus this is our native dandelion um, it disperses really well it's absolutely beautiful if you pick it at the right time and blow it and make a wish it comes true too um, 
And this is an absolutely great restoration plant. And there are a number of these um, agoceruses that you'll find up there. Um, uh, this is obviously it in fruit, which could easily be confused with it being in flower as people walk up to and say, what's that white flower? Um, this, is, this is one that I think also has a good job, does a good job of dispersing. There are winds out there and such. And so this is one that I think will continue to be a winner um, just due to the fact that it can um, uh, distribute itself really well via wind. Um, anyone know who this one is? I know it's hard to tell. Brownie. Brownie. Yes. Oh. Yes, you know it's Stu. Stu, you were with me when I took this picture, so that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is brownie thistle. This is one of our native um, thistles. Grows low to the ground. Look at the amount of nectar and resources on there. Um, Liam O'Brien is a great mentor and I love spending time with him and learning from him every chance I get. And he's always worried about, oh, we can't cut the thistles down. They're nectar sources for all the butterflies. Um, and it's true, they are important nectar sources. At the same time, this guy is a perennial, um, grows low to the ground and is absolutely gorgeous and looks completely different than any of the non-natives. So this is one that I would love to get established in a lot more places, but um, a really, really neat plant. Um, and then the bracken fern. So we talked about, uh, I believe it was, Tom talked about, um, Manzanita, uh, Uva Ursi being uh, uh, well distributed. Uh, one of my early mentors, Bruce Delgado, who does botany in uh, Monterey, believes this is the single most widely distributed plant in the world. And um, this was brought to fame with Ansel Adams. He did a really neat uh, display, or not Ansel Adams, I'm sorry, um, Goldsworthy did a really neat display on this. In, um, one of his films, but this is bracken fern. So you can eat this, you can pickle it. Um, so to those developers who say you can't eat the lilies and the, uh, and the wildflowers, this is certainly one you can eat. And a lot of people, have, um, <laughs> a lot of cultures have discovered that over the ages. So this is it just unraveling its fronds. Couple more, chocolate lily, um, hard to, not talk about the lilies. This is one that's highly um, coastal. One thing that we find as a general rule is coastal cooler plants tend to have slightly richer colors. Um, and we also, I believe, see this in the butterfly and the butterfly taxa. As you move from coastal to inland, you typically find the richer, darker colors right along the edge. And then they, they kind of, um, uh, get a lot lighter as you move more inland where there's more warmth and they don't benefit from being dark. So the chocolate lily is interesting um, for a number of reasons. There are some interesting hybrids that are being studied in Marin, um, but this is just a gorgeous plant that you can find um, throughout uh, several areas of the park. And again, one of those awkward photos, um, just being able to see the chocolate lily as its fruit develops. Um, it's it's just a really neat process, and they their fruits are actually really fantastic. And they're these capsules, and they have six six little ridges on them, and in there you'll find all the fruits. Um, the fruits actually do take many many years to then develop into a bulb, and then eventually plant. So it's one of those that needs a lot of time and <clears throat> benefits less from disturbance. Um, and then finally, we all know this one. This is a California poppy. Um, I thought I'd throw in a moment of um, botanical ID in here. The reason uh, this is the way California poppy is um, pulled away from all the other poppies, all the Ascholzias, is this thing. Some people call it a disc. Um, some people call it a collar. Uh, I believe formally it's called a torus. Um, if this torus from edge to end is greater than half a millimeter, it swings you into uh, the California poppy. It's the biggest, it's the grandest. And then when this torus starts to diminish, so if you're starting to see populations of poppies with really, really tiny um, leftover toruses, they may tell you you're seeing something a little bit different like cestitosa 
or even some of the other more rare ones. Um, interestingly, there's a lot of uh, uh, research going on around poppies, and some people believe California poppies are actually invasive in other areas. Um, and uh, they've done some uh, experiments by bringing some of these plants down to Chile and then bringing some of the Chilean ones up to California. Um, really remarkable research around it in case you have a, a few hours to spend um, learning about poppies. And then this one uh, is a really interesting um, taxon that I found out on the mountain. And, um, you know, it's called Alophyllum purpuram, Alphylum purpuram. Uh, which it used to be Orobanki, which was seemingly easier to pronounce. But this is purple broom rape, naturally. Um, you might say, hmm, I wonder about that. And <laughs> this is one undergoing some genetic analysis and relumping and, and such. But um, it is this beautiful, completely parasitic plant. So you will never see anything green on the broom rapes. This one typically grows um, associated with Asteraceae and it locks into those roots and they'll live underground for 20, 30 years. Um, flower when it's a good time to flower, otherwise just sit in the soil kind of quietly and wait for a good year. Um, Salvia spathacea, uh, hummingbird sage, um, well regarded, well known. This is one that Jim Roof loved. This is definitely a signature of what we see on the mountain. It likes these wetter draws. It's absolutely fragrant. It forms really large monocultural colonies, but it always leaves a little room for some friends. Um, and so this is really a great plant to, for pollinators, for nectar resources, um, for soil stability. Also, interestingly, I threw on this chart from Calflora. Um, you can see we are up here. The majority of Salvia spathacea and the hummingbird sage is a little bit south of us. Um, and this is where it seems to do a little bit better. Uh, interestingly, these populations up here in the Bay Area might be something a little bit different, adapted to slightly different um, conditions, um, but there hasn't been much work done on this one in particular. It's, it's one of those that you kind of awe and awe at and just enjoy. Um, so I think I just have a couple more here to finish up. This is Waithia angustifolia, the mule's ears. Um, you know, one of my favorite times is just seeing these little yellow lanterns out in the, out in the grasslands. It's, uh, they're gorgeous, they're showy, they attract a lot of bugs. Um, and one of my favorite parts of photographing the, you know, some of these flowers is looking at the photographs afterwards and see who I missed in there. And there will always be tons of weevils and ants and bugs and such enjoying these plants. They're such rich resources. Um, and so that's also something to think about as much as we talked about butterflies. There are a lot of other insects that make uh, San Bruno Mountain pretty amazing. And that's all I have.